Good morning. Thank you for joining us. My name is Daniel Conway, and I'm here this morning on behalf of the Save Our Students Coalition. Uh, we are a group of parents, community-based organizations, uh, labor groups, business groups, uh, and many others who have basically decided that we're going to do whatever it takes in our power to address the challenges at Sac City Unified School District. Uh, and as we're going to discuss today, the challenges facing our schools are many. Um, not only do we face uh, an ongoing labor dispute between our district and our teachers union, we are on the brink of insolvency and state takeover. And as we will hear more of this morning, uh, we mistreat so many of our young students, uh, particularly black boys and girls. Uh, so we're at a point where we recognize that there's a lot of work that needs to be done to address these systemic issues and to get to the real roots of, of these challenges. And uh, we're proud to be joined today by Dr. Luke Wood of San Diego State University, who's going to at least help us address some one set of those issues. Uh, Dr. Wood, uh, two years ago, released uh, the Capitalist Suspensions Report, which was done with in conjunction with the local NAACP chapter and a number of other community groups. This study, this initial study, brought to light um, the terrible treatment, frankly, of, that was experienced by uh, young black boys in our school district. This year, Dr. Wood came back with an update to his study. And unfortunately, as he'll explain, um, the news hasn't gotten any better and we still have a lot of work to do. So without further ado, I want to introduce Dr. Wood, as well as uh, his co-author, uh, graduate student, Mohammed Abdi Kass, uh, for them to give us a briefing and an overview of their findings. And then following that, we will have a panel discussion with Dr. Wood, as well as Betty Williams from the Sacramento NAACP, Cassandra Jennings from the Greater Sacramento Urban League, Stephanie Bray from the United Way, and Carl Pinkston from the Black Parallel School Board. Thank you again for joining us and uh, we look forward to your support and your continued advocacy in our community. All right, welcome everyone um, to the briefing on the report, the capital of suspensions. My name is Luke Wood and I serve as a professor at San Diego State University in the College of Education. And I'm joined by my co-author, uh, Mohammed Abdi Kass, who is a PhD student at San Diego State University as well. And for the past several years, we have been working collaboratively with a number of community-based organizations to do reports that focus on what we call exclusionary discipline, which Mohammed will talk about um, later on in our presentation, and suspensions being a critical form of exclusionary discipline that we're very concerned with. So we wanna thank uh, those who are able to join us today. And the title of this uh, presentation is Black Minds Matter, the Education of Black Children in Sacramento City Unified School District. So I wanted to begin with a little bit of framing in terms of some of the concerns um, that, that we see. Oftentimes when we go and we present data, and we've done a number of these reports, which you'll, you'll see uh, momentarily, uh, oftentimes response from educators, from school administrators, from even sometimes from community members is to think that if there is a breakdown in student performance in terms of academic success rates or high suspension rates, that it must be something that is dealing with the students, their families and their communities, what we call the blame game, right? And so it is oftentimes a response for some people to say, what the heck is wrong with these kids and their parents? Why aren't they doing what it takes for them to be successful here? And what we find is that that framing and sense making is not aligned with the research based data, which demonstrates that the challenges themselves, while there's certainly community based uh, needs that we need to be focused on and attentive to, that many of the challenges that we're seeing in terms of disparities are actually a function of how people are viewed differently. We see that a black child and a white child or, and a Latinx child may be viewed very differently based upon the background and experience and preparation of that teacher. And too often we find that when it comes to our black students and our Native American students, that we do not do a good job in providing the types of support that are needed for their success because of our society that is, is really informed by a racist, racist lens. Now, what we believe is this is that we want to move forward. We want to improve the outcomes that we're gonna be talking about in this 
in this presentation that we have to engage the problem from a different lens, right? We have to say to ourselves, what are we doing or not doing as a district or school that results in our black students not doing as well as they should? And it's only when we start to personalize this, to recognize the role that each one of us has in creating a system that prioritizes some, views some as being intelligent and some people as being moral and draws others down at the same time, that that is a, an illegitimate system that we must address. And so we think it's important for this framing so that when you see this data, it's to recognize that behind these numbers are stories and oftentimes stories of pain, stories of discomfort, stories of lack of support. And what we wanna do is shed light on this darkness that is taking place in Sacramento City Unified School District. Now, we'd also like to connect this to the larger conversation that has taken place in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. Uh, many individuals took to the streets um, after the murder of George Floyd to essentially bring to light the issues that we see in terms of how black lives are treated disproportionately and with a sense of criminalization in policing. And in fact, we have oftentimes made the direct connection in our work between Black Lives Matter and Black Minds Matter, which are two, uh, two different um, efforts that are in many ways linked and intermingled and combined. Black lives and Black minds are intertwined. If one does not value the life, then they certainly will not value the mind. And so with that, we'd like to start out with just how some of these larger issues are playing out and also to show that there are direct parallels between what we see in terms of policing and what we see challenges in schooling. So this is a study from Sadler and colleagues 2012. And what they did was a study where they brought police officers out to a range to essentially shoot, right? And what they were going to do is a study that looked at how officers would make determinations about shooting or not shooting in a particular or given situation. So one of the things that they did is they gave the police officers targets. Some of them were black males, some of them were white males, right? So black targets, white targets, and some of them were armed and some of them were armed, unarmed. And the goal of the, stu of the study was to say, if someone is armed, then you should shoot. If they are not armed, then you should not shoot. So if they're armed, you shoot. If they're not armed, you don't shoot. And then they measured the time that it took for someone to make the determination to not shoot. So because this is a, a discussion on bias and some of the challenges that are facing the black community, many of you would guess what the outcome of that study was, which is that the police officers were more likely to shoot when the suspect was black, but they were also more likely to go both in cases where the suspect was armed and in cases when the suspect was unarmed. Even more, the decision to not shoot was measured as part of the study, and it took officers a much longer time to make that determination. And what we know is this, in policing, we oftentimes find that black lives are undervalued and that they are over-criminalized because the nature of our society is one that has drawn down and deprioritized and demoralized black lives. We see very similar patterns also in the field of education. And that's why beginning um, a number of years ago, we began working on, on reports and research that's focused on, on black students throughout the country. One of those reports was called Get Out, Black Male Suspensions in California Public Schools. And this report um, was the first one that we did that highlighted disproportionate rates of suspensions that are taking place across the state of California. And really it began to give us an insight, particularly into the capital region. And what we found is that Sacramento is home to some of the most egregious suspension rates in the entire state of California. And in fact, what we have regularly found is that because of these rates, in many ways, there's clear parallels between what we see in DC, Washington, DC, and what we see here. In DC, you have the nation's capital, right? The seat of power of all the decision-making that takes place in our country surrounded by some of the worst schools in the nation. And so we believe from the data that we see is that Sacramento is the DC of the West. And we think that we need to do something about that. The other thing that we'd like to highlight is some of the other reports that we've done. 
One was in collaborations uh, with our colleagues from SNAHEC, um, titled From Boarding Schools to Suspension Boards, Suspensions and Expulsions of Native American Students. This is actually a pretty recent report that we did not that long ago in collaborations with our colleagues um, from that organization. And one of the things that I would say that we have learned across all of the work that we've done is that when you are looking at the most highest rates of suspensions, invariably, it is going to be Black males. And unfortunately, when you look at the most highest rates of expulsions, invariably, it's Native American boys. And so oftentimes, we try to bring those two conversations together because that is what the data are showing us are the groups who are most disproportionately impacted, who are facing the most egregious suspension rates. We also recently released a report in our home area of, of San Diego, though I uh, am from Sacramento, titled When They Teach Us, the Education of Black Children in San Diego, looking at linkage between data and what we see as essentially the predictors of the school to prison pipe, pipeline. And what we know is this, the school to prison pipeline is stood up by two pillars. The first pillar is exclusionary discipline, such as suspensions and expulsions. The second pillar is significant overplacement in special education. And really it's the combination of those two things that leads to some of the incredible disparities that we see throughout our criminal injustice system. So with that, I'm gonna have uh, Mohammed get us rolling and to start talking about this capital of suspensions report. And so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to him. Mohammed. Thank, thank you, Dr. Wood. So in recent years, there have been an increased focus on the exposure of black students to exclusionary discipline, which are disciplinary practices that remove the student from the learning environment. Some common examples of this would include um, referrals, in-school suspensions, um, out-of-school suspensions, and expulsions. Exclusionary discipline can also restrict participation in the form of not allowing the child to play at recess, um, not allowing the child to participate in field trips, and after school activities. In terms of public attention, the most, noticeable, the, most, the most noticeable focuses have been on suspension rates. In California, much attention has been placed on the egregious suspension rates that are endemic to schools serving black students throughout the state. In 2018, we released a report titled The Capital of Suspensions. This report documented high rates of exclusionary discipline experienced by black male students attending schools in Sacramento County. Findings demonstrated that black students were 5.4 times more likely to be suspended than the statewide average. While reports identified that Sacramento County had four of the top 20 suspension districts for black males in the state of California, Sacramento City Unified School District was also named the most egregious suspension district in the state for having the highest total suspensions of black males in California. This report serves as the follow-up to our previous report. Sacramento City Unified School District had, had the third highest total suspensions of black students in the state of California, following only Elk Grove Unified and Fresno Unified. During that year, there were a total of 1,104 individual black students who were suspended for a total of 2012 suspensions. Data provided in this brief can be publicly accessed through the source of California Department of Education. This includes suspension calculations from DataQuest, a publicly available resource that enables cross-group analysis at state, county, district, and school levels. These, there are two types of suspensions reported by the state, including in-school suspensions and out-school suspensions. These rates are representatives these, uh, these rates are representative of both traditional public schools and charter schools. All public local education agencies provide data to the California Department of Education that are represented in the system. Thus, the data source, the data sources offered are here, um, the data sources offered here are based on those provided by the LEAs and the state of California. So essentially, one of the big takeaways from that is that these data are from the schools and school districts themselves. They provide this to the state. So as was mentioned, the first report was the capital of suspensions, and this is a follow-up brief, looking specifically at a deeper dive, not just in Sacramento County, but looking at um, the district itself. 
Um, as part of our analysis, one of the things that we wanted to do is to tr provide what is a relative point of reference for us to use to determine what is egregious, what is not egregious. And we think that the statewide average of suspension across all groups probably serves as a reasonable average for understanding what it should look like. The statewide average in, in the most recent data that is available was 3.5%. That means that three and a half out of every 100 students are suspended at least once. Now that's what we call an unduplicated suspension rate, meaning that it is a single suspension rate for a student, a single student in a single year. That does not account for a student who is suspended multiple times in a given year, which we will report some of those towards the latter end of this. And it does not account for students who are suspended, let's say kindergarten, then first grade, then second grade, so the accumulation of suspensions this is only the annual rate. So remember that's number, 3.5%. Now with 3.5%, you might ask yourself, okay, well, how statewide do African-Americans uh, perform against that? Well, the statewide average for suspensions uh, is 9.1% for African-Americans and 7.5% for uh, Native Americans. So again, that is exorbitantly higher already than the 3.5% we see as a statewide average. However, when we start looking closer at Sacramento, we find uh, that the district average is 13.5%, so much higher. But let's delve into this further and look at what does this look like across different groups. So we find that based upon our data that 17.7%, 17.7% .7 of black male students in the district are being suspended in an annual year. Again, the statewide average is only, what, three and a half percent. That's more than five times the statewide average. For black girls, it's 9.3%, which is also markedly higher than the statewide average. And so we see these, when we see these data, it, these are examples of what we would call egregious suspension rates. We believe that Sacramento is ground zero for some of the worst suspensions in the state of California. Now, what we've also found in prior reports is that Sacramento City, again, was the number one district. It's now the number three, and we've seen Elk Grove move up. And what we are concerned about is the potential that Sac City issues may now be metastasizing across the city of Sacramento. Now, here are the, the data that we have broken out by racial groups. So you can see both for race and for gender what these rates look like. I would like to just point out uh, two different rates to help juxtapose. The suspension rates for black males, as you can see in the left-hand side, as we said previously, is 17.7%. The suspension rates for black females is 9.3%. And then look at what the rates look like across all the other groups, right? We see some really... Um, clear disparities that we need to be attentive to. I'd like to point out the rate for white students which, where white female students are suspended at a 1.5% suspension rate. Again, all this can be relative to what is a statewide rate, which is three and a half percent. So we see major issues across groups um, in the Sacramento region. Now, one of our colleagues, Dr. Ebony Zamani Gallagher, um, has said that we can ill afford to have a throwaway group, really talking about how unfortunately for many of our black students, these issues are oftentimes overlooked and undervalued. We don't believe that we can have a throwaway group in the city of Sacramento. There's too much um, decision-making that is taking place. The city is views itself as a progressive city. And one of the things that was a takeaway that we had, again, looking at this data, and looking at this data was this, is that the rates of suspension that we're seeing are more reflective of what you would expect from the South in the 1960s and 1970s, not one of the most progressive cities in the nation. Now, when we looked across the data, one of the things that we wanted to do was identify both where the high percentages of suspensions were taking place and where the greatest disparities in suspensions were also occurring. The highest suspension rates invariably always occur in middle school. And we've seen that across all of our reports across all different groups. And as you can see here, for black males in the district, it's a 25% suspension rate in middle school. And statewide, it's a 6.7% for the overall average for students. So still markedly higher than it should be. But what we wanna look at is also the disparity. 
Meaning, what is the difference between that statewide average and the percentage that we would see in Sacramento City Unified School District? And what we find from that analysis is this, that the highest suspension rates are not in high school. They're not in middle school. They're not in latter elementary, fourth through sixth grade. They're in early childhood education where black males are 10.4 times more likely to be suspended than their peers. We're talking about early childhood education where essentially what Sacramento has done is taken students from potty training to punishment. And we think that that's something that has to be addressed as part of this larger issue and this larger effort. Now, if we look across other different demographics, we can also see some differences that are important for us to note and take and take uh, and be attentive to. For example, we see that when we look at black males, there's a 36.8% suspension rate for those who identify as foster youth. Myself, I'm a former foster child, as, as is my twin brother. I grew up in a foster home. Um, and when I see this, um, I say to myself that this is egregious, that we should not be targeting students who are in need of the greatest level of support. We also see higher suspension rates for students who, have, uh, who are with disabilities. So ultimately what is happening here is that some of our most vulnerable population are K through three, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, students with disabilities, foster youth who are black students are the ones that are being disproportionately targeted. And we think that that has to be addressed as part of a larger effort to improve what we see in the capital region and the capital city. Now, one of the things that we wanted to do that was different in this report than we've done um, in some of the others is to highlight where is the problem occurring, right? And what we did on this chart here is we provide suspension rates for black male students where the suspensions are at either 20% or higher. So 20% or higher for those suspension rates. Uh, now, again, remember that the statewide average is only three and a half percent. So when you're talking about a suspension rate that is at 20 percent going up to suspension rates of 45 percent, again, there's no other word that can be used to describe this um, other than it's egregious. So let's start out with the, the top uh, school here, which is Cesar Chavez Intermediate, which has a annual suspension rate based upon that most recent data of 45.8 percent. That means that nearly half, nearly half of the black students who are in that school were suspended at least once during that year. Followed by Rosa Parks Elementary at 38%, Oak Park Prep at 38%, Kit Carson at 37%, Elder Creek at 37%, Wilsey Wood at 37%. And so these are egregiously high suspension rates. I'll also note that on the far right-hand column, we have put what are multiple suspension rates. These are rates where you have higher percentages of students who are being suspended once, twice, or even more in a given year. And you can see that really high rates in the 60 percentage at Kit Carson, at Elder Creek, at Ethel Phillips, and at um, uh, John Morris Thera Therapeutic, um, and uh, Ethel Baker. So some of these schools have really high multiple suspension rates as well. The last thing that I'd like to point out on this um, before I move to the next slide and show what this looks like for black girls is that some people might say, well, look at some of these numbers. Oak Park Prep only has 21 black male students. And let's look at John Morris, that only has 22. And Bret Hart only has 39. Well, that's a small population. Is it really that big of a deal? And we have heard this unfortunately repeatedly from educational leaders um, when these, they see these data. And this is what we believe is that a small number of black students doesn't make the problem less important. It actually makes the problem more acute because you have a smaller number of people who are being hyper surveilled and being targeted at these schools. And we believe um, that that actually has to be viewed with even more intensity and caution um, than those schools with the larger sample sizes. In addition, we also wanted to provide the data for black females. Again, we presented the, the rate earlier in terms of what that percentage looked like. This uh, district-wide suspension rate was 9.3%. Here you have schools where the suspension rate at the very least is 15% and above. At the top, you'll notice that we have uh, John D. Sloat at 26.8%, Wilsey Wood at 26%, Hiram Johnson at 26%. And you'll also note that many of the schools that are on this list 
are also the same schools that are on the other list for black male students. And so what we see is that there are also some schools that should be immediately, um, there should be immediate interventions. We should not view this as something that continue to, conti to move forward. Uh, and we think that, again, this is a time for us to, to, um, to be able to engage in these conversations. And the reason is right now, many schools are in a Zoom environment. And what we want to do is make sure that when things go back, that we don't go back to normal. We don't go back to business as usual because we recognize that normal and business as usual have produced oppression for certain communities. I'd also like to share the data that we have regarding charter schools. One of the things that we see across the country or especially across the state, I should say, is that charter schools usually have a lower suspension rate than traditional public schools. And the same thing is evident in the Sacramento region. However, what we also notice in this region is that there's a very high disparity rate between charter schools um, um, in terms of suspensions of black male students and black female students in comparison to that statewide average, far exceeding of what that statewide average is. And as a result, we also know um, that we have to have attention on charter schools. Now, some people might see this data and say, oh, well, we can dismiss it. But we have always known that when it comes to charter schools, that they are more effective in navigating around mandatory reporting and some of the things that need to be done that we see in the traditional public schools. So oftentimes we would expect there to be a lower suspension rate, but a lower suspension rate is not necessarily indicative of what's actually taking place on the ground. Oftentimes it's a barometer, an indicator of a more insidious um, pattern that is taking place. What we'd like to do is close by offering some advice in particular for the parents of black children. Seeing this data, I hope uh, spurs individuals to want to engage in movement and efforts to change what is taking place. But for, so we have some never statements that we would recommend for families. The first one comes from a colleague, Andre Branch, who said, never leave your child in an unhealthy environment for the evenness for the sake of a quote unquote, good school. Muhammad Abdi, a colleague here, has regularly said that just because it's a good school for everyone doesn't mean it's a good school for Black children. And that is true. And in fact, we believe that in some ways it's marvelous how you can have two children in the same classroom, same teacher, same desk, same setup, same social environment, same students, and they can have two wildly different experiences. It is unacceptable. Never assume that your child deserves the suspension, especially in early childhood education. Oftentimes we find that see, these suspensions are a function of assuming that black children will be bad, labeling them, hyper-focusing on them and being attentive to anything that they do, and then singling out them, them out for punishment, even when the punishment mirrors, uh, even when their behavior mirrors that of other children in the classroom. And so, especially in early childhood education, no one in kindergarten through third grade should just assume that what has taken place is something that is proper. The next thing, never assume that your school is aware of their success data with black children. Show them. And here's why. We have oftentimes presented this data to schools and almost invariably I hear from school principals, well, where did you get this data from? And my response to them is the same as Muhammad's response. Well, this is the data that you reported to the state. And so it's important to make sure to show them because people can't make a change unless they know what the problem is. And so we think it's important to make sure that every school is examining their data, thinking through their data, talking through their data. And we're not here merely to fire shots at the district, we're here to support. So if we can be helpful in facilitating and supporting those conversations, we are more than willing to do so because Sacramento is the seat of power for our state and this is unacceptable. Never allow a teacher or principal to refer to your child as a problem child, a bad child, a troublemaker, physical, defiant, overly aggressive. There's lots of code words that we have found used um, to refer to black children that label them. And with labeling, what happens is that label follows that child throughout the rest of their educational trajectory as teachers talk to one another about the child. So even if a child has not ever demonstrated any quote unquote problematic behavior, they can oftentimes be framed as a problem simply because of racist ideologies and practices. Never allow the school to reprimand your child without questioning what occurred and whether there are other children who did the same thing. 
again, we find invariably that the number one theme we have in the qualitative data that we collect is students being singled out for punishment when they have done things that mirror what other children have also done. Never assume that the challenges your child faces are isolated. Most likely other parents of black children are experiencing the same thing. We believe that to be absolutely true, that they can be experiencing the same thing. Um, so this is what we have found. When we go and we present data to the parents, you can have different communities of black people, right? There's the black community is a very diverse community. And oftentimes you'll find is that people think it's just them or it's just their sub community within the community. The truth is we have to be engaged in conversations. The data here, again, demonstrate that these issues are manifested throughout the entire county and are particularly acute in Elk Grove and Sacramento City Unified. And don't worry, we're coming with an, another report that's gonna focus on the larger county data and we'll be going further into what these patterns look like within the county of Sacramento. We'd also like to offer some recommendations for schools and school districts and school leaders. Professional learning is the way to go. Um, one of the things that we know is that educators need intensive ongoing professional learning on unconscious bias, racial microaggressions, culture mediated behaviors, teaching practices for black children and the like. One of our doctoral students at San Diego State um, who just graduated, Dr. Sammy Scales, once said to me, it doesn't take money to treat people decently. And ultimately that's what we're talking about. We're talking about essentially training people to, te to teach people more decently. So oftentimes there is conversations like, oh, well, we're never gonna be able to afford to address these issues. But what are we really talking about? We're talking about simply treating people with kindness, with respect, viewing a child as a child who's learning, who's growing, who's developing, and not seeing them as a problem or a future prisoner. Establish a citywide exclusionary discipline task force that can investigate districts and schools in a county with egregiously high suspensions. We would recommend starting out with those lists that we provided in the report that highlight some very concerning schools. Enhance school resources to identify and support students who have experienced personal trauma. Require advocates be involved, especially with any suspensions of, of foster youth. I think those egregious suspension rates have to be examined much more closely. We need advocates so that when there is a determination that's being made, that there is someone else who is involved, preferably the child's social worker and an external advocate from that social worker as well. Providing avenues for students to report educators who they feel are unduly targeting them for discipline with follow-up with students afterwards. This is what we know. Even when we go to children in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, we can talk to them. We can sit down and say, who are the teachers who treat you nice? Who are the teachers who don't? Who are the teachers you like? Who are the teachers you dislike? And you know what? Even in kindergarten, a student can give you indications that there is mistreatment that is occurring. Again, this is not every educator, but we do know that oftentimes when we look at schools, that there is a group of teachers who are repeatedly engaging this behavior and we have to begin to call and hold people accountable. I heard someone say one time um, in talking about police officers, well, most police officers are good. It's only a few bad apples. And so if you have 95% uh, of them are good and 5% are bad, isn't it not that bad? Right, But the truth is if the 95% don't stand up and say something about the 5%, then they are part of the problem as well. The same thing with teachers. We have to hold them accountable for the treatment and engagement and support of our black children. And lastly, implementation of restorative justice practices. And also we believe that in order to do so, you have to start out with a firm foundation. Early childhood education should not be the most egregious area where we see suspensions because ultimately restorative justice relies upon the approach that we're restoring a relationship, but you cannot restore something that never uh, was in a good place that began broken, right? And so the practices themselves won't be able to take hold in the same type of way unless there is this hyper-focus. Lastly, I would say what, what one of the things that scares me the most with this data is seeing the great disparity in K-3 and knowing that our state does not do a good job of collecting suspensions and expulsions in preschool. 
So imagine if we're seeing these rates in early childhood education and K3 and preschool is an important piece of that, that black box may be a, a representation of some of the worst suspensions and expulsions that we um, are experiencing, but ultimately that we do not see. So with that in mind, we want to thank you for joining us. Thank you for participating in reviewing this and just want to close by again reminding us that Sacramento City Unified School District suspends black boys in early childhood education at more than 10 times the statewide average. That is unacceptable. That is disappointing. And it needs to change. Thank you. Is that uh, the thing, you know, education is personal. And we work with a lot of parents uh, that are frustrated right now, that are just angry, uh, that want the success for their children. And when I looked at the list, I saw two things that were really disturbing to me. Rosa Parks, number one, because that's the same middle school that my kids went to. And then John F. Kennedy, which my nephew, who we're guardians of, just graduated from last year. How can we have these schools that we entrust our children in every day to be failing the masses? And so when I look at your recommendations, um, and I hope we get to talk more about the African American Advisory Board, but I, I want to just emphasize one, the cultural and the importance of culture and climate. And I know we talked about that. Um, it's more than a report. We need to change sort of the culture of all of our schools and of our system so that it is more welcome and supported of all kids. And I can't for the life figure out why an elementary school, a K through three person would be suspended for anything. <laughs> you know, that's just so, it's so important for the foundation. Um, we expect that of our schools and we need to make sure that it happens right here in the capital city in the place we call home. So I could go on and on, but I'm going to turn it back over to you, Daniel. <laughs> no, and thank you so much, Cassandra. Um, I, and yeah, I think you're, you're saying what a lot of us are thinking and feeling. So Stephanie, do you mind kind of giving us your thoughts? Sure. Um, so first of all, thank you for, for inviting me to join this discussion. After I read the report, the first person I called was Ruben Reyes, who is the superintendent of the Robles School District. And since 2016, our United Way has been in partnership with that school district. And our goal has been to ensure that not only are those children ready to graduate from high school, but to go on to, to some kind of higher education or career technical training. And we have been intentional through our work in focusing on early childhood education. And so what we know is since we've been involved with the Robles School District, which is one of the most diverse school districts in Sac County and the poorest school district. And it is a minority majority school district. However, the majority of students are Latino or Eastern European or um, Asian. African American suspension was higher than all of those groups still. And they are the smallest percentage of students. So what did they do? They, they in essentially, um, the recommendations that, that you make in your report is what they did. They implemented the professional development around not just implicit bias, but just anti-racist training. They also an analyzed the data so that they could identify, you know, who, why, what were the reasons, which classrooms, which teachers, and then they disaggregated that data so that they could really understand you know, and put the blame on the blamee, right? And, and, and lift up the fact that there was nothing wrong with kids who were in K to three, why would you need to suspend them? They also implemented um, positive behavior intervention and support. They worked with parents to help train them on how to provide positive reinforcement to their children. They worked with the staff. They even trained their board on 
restorative justice and what that means, right? They engage the entire school community and they change the mindset. They change the entire culture. And so in the school year 2018, 2019, it was no longer the case that their African-American students were being suspended at a higher rate. They also received significant support from Sac County Office of Education. They wrote grants and got funding for training. When they started, they had one social worker for the five schools in their district, and it's an elementary only district. They now have a social worker in every one of their schools. And they didn't rob a bank. They didn't you know, rob Peter to pay Paul in their budget. What they did was they made it a priority. And, and they continue to this, to this day. I mean, we've been partnering with them to ensure that their students have the technology they need for distance learning. Their teachers are still on the campus providing that support. And so I will say that this can be done. It's not impossible. It takes the will, it takes collaboration, it takes engaging parents, and it takes the belief that every child has the potential to be successful, irrespective of the color of their skin, and that they are not to be blamed for being children. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. And that, again, such a powerful point. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, lastly, Carl, uh, thank you for joining us today. And, and again, would love to hear your thoughts uh, just about kind of uh, what Dr. Wood shared with us this morning uh, with Sac City. So thank you, Carl. Well, um, thank, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be on the panel today um, and uh, learning a lot, but I also have to say I did miss his presentations because I got kicked out. So I read the report and I went deep into the report. Um, uh, uh, so at, at another time, I would love to um, see more of the presentation. But nevertheless, um, we also have to acknowledge that the city of Sacramento in particular and the Sac City Unified School District it is a racist, institutionally racist institution, and it historically has been since its founding. So when the Sac City Unified School District was created in the 1860s, they had a separate school district and a separate school for black folks, and all the whites went to the other. So that, we have to acknowledge first and foremost that our current educational system is racist by design. So if we acknowledge that and not assume that it is race neutral or race evasive, then we can actually lean in to actually tr uh, to, to address the issues. Um, I, I am um, a, a appalled uh, once again in terms of just the, the numbers of students, particularly black and, and, and uh, male and, and female students that are suspended from K, kindergarten to third grade. Uh, the Black Parallel School Board was part of a statewide campaign to address that issue as it relates for willful defiance because in the past they would suspend our kids just because you wore your hair, your hat, had your hat on were in the back or you just had a bad attitude. So you were suspended for willful defiance in the past and we've been able to successfully get a um, new legislation that was supposed, that was going to be implemented in July, uh, dealing with that issue from kindergarten to, third, to, to eighth grade. But the other thing, but the challenge has been in this district is to acknowledge the fact that we have a racist institution from the top all the way to the bottom. And to what it, what it clearly shows that there's not a will and there's not a consistency to implement the process. So part of that has to do with, you know, um, what Stephanie Ray uh, talked about in terms of positive behavior intervention service. Remember, LA used to have a really high suspension rate. And, and once, they, once they implemented with the partnership of Cadre, they drove theirs down to 3%. And yeah. so it can be done. It's just a question of whether or not we want to implement it in our district. That's number one. Number two, to provide the kind of professional development at, at front and center 
it was oftentimes is thought as an afterthought, not as front and center of doing professional development for the entire administration. So it's it's a it's a opt in, not necessarily you know uh, the what we used to call the professional development of the willing. Um, is the, is is and that should not be the case. We were able to work to get it as mandatory professional development back in 2014 that still have not been implemented. So there's a number of things that the leadership, the, the, the structure have not been able to move on these issues. And then lastly, remember now, suspension, and, and there will be new forms of suspension coming out of this, um, we, we're, we're talking about now the expanded form of suspension coming out of this COVID period where, you know, they put kids in these little breakout rooms and things like that. One of the things that we were also recognized that there's a connection between suspension and literacy. That kids, if they're not in the classroom, they're not learning. And if they're not getting the quality education in terms of literacy and math, they will check out. And so the, those two are interconnected. And one of the things that this um, the, uh, Luke Woods re, uh, report demonstrates is that, that this, what, what's existing in our system is so systemic and so deep that it will take a really concerted effort to really move and transform the educational system all across the board. So in an attempt to address one piece, the system figures out another way to push out our kids um, uh, out, of the, out of the education system and denying them the quality education system. So it, it, and particularly right now we're dealing with uh, students with black students with disability, which are even higher rates of suspension as well. Thank you, Carl. Uh, and again, really appreciate the advocacy that you guys have done in this space and the, and the perspective that you bring. Um, you know, I, I kind of want to connect a couple dots and some of the things that have been said and, and again, hear more from you all. But but what I'm hearing is, is, you know, we have a district that is, you know, as we've heard, historically racist from its founding. Uh, and we see data to this it's to this day kind of showing that that is functioning accordingly. Um, and yet at the same time, we live in a community where, as we know, we've seen you know, police shootings of, of unarmed black men. We've seen a rising social justice movement in response to, the, response to that. So I, I can't help but to see a, a continuum between kind of how we treat our kids and, and the adulthood that they have to look forward to. Um, so I, I see that. And then at the same time, frankly, I see a school district where uh, there's a recognition that we have these challenges. I want to hear more from Carl about kind of the, the, the reforms that have been agreed to but not implemented. I want to hear more from Cassandra about the work of the uh, African American Advisory Committee. But I guess we all have to be conscious of the fact that, you know, just this week that, that the board's looking at voting on budget cuts that, that would, you know, take more resources away from schools and classrooms. So, so I, I want to hear what we can do and I want to hear how we can, you know, save this next generation of kids. But I also want to be aware of kind of the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Um, so with that, uh, Betty, do you mind kind of starting us off in terms of your thoughts on those topics? Okay. Um, Cassandra actually made me think about just personally when I seen John still on there, my grandchildren are going to that school and the, the suspension expulsion rate. But um, as far as NAACP, we, we receive a number of issues and our top two issues always and every day is either criminal justice or education. And so I always have believed that the two um, are connected in every way. And so one of the things when the findings first came out um, that we did as a branch, we actually held town, town hall meetings as well as online. And from that, we reached out to not just SAC Unified School District, but to San Juan, um, Elk Grove, Folsom, and some others. Um, Robles in particular, I'm glad to hear that they are doing um, so much better, Stephanie, because at one point, within our NAACP office, we had three cases of five and six-year-olds just from that one school district 
that had an average of 17 suspensions apiece, five and six years old. And so one of the things that we did, we reached out um, to the schools and to the, um, uh, the school board as well, and the principal to start to figure out what was going on. And in that particular case, we pinpointed a teacher, a single teacher that was doing all of these suspensions. And they knew who she was. They knew her background, but they could not get rid of her because of the union. So they were forced to have this teacher that knew that they knew was a bad apple um, that was suspending five and six year old black males in that school district. So to hear your story today makes me feel better about Robles because I was feeling differently until a moment ago. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. But those are the type of stories that we are getting. And so it, it's, it is going to take a whole community. And so when I say that we have a number of issues, the other thing that we're working with is CPS. Um, we have, for whatever reason, received an uptick of complaints in the NAACP office of CPS issues. Not the fact that um, cases have increased, but Black parents and Black social workers are saying there's systemic racism within CPS. So we are actively involved in trying to find out why our kids in Sacramento are staying in the system longer than any other race, any other race. And so when I asked the question about foster kids, which you also um, talked about those numbers, in Sacramento, 40% of our black children are in the foster care system. I just got, because of a meeting I just had uh, two days ago, I got those statistics two days ago. 40% of African Americans are in the foster care system. And so, but yet you talk about suspension is 36.8% from foster care. And I don't know, um, Luke, if that percentage was based on SAC Unified School District only or overall. But the fact that we have 40% of our kids in the system, that's a problem. So what we're doing right now is working with those black social workers who are appalled by this as well. Um, on making policy changes. So we have a meeting with them next week on things that are keeping our children in the system. And in addition to that, we need to, I believe, work also outside of the school district. So when we have measures out there like Measure G, that's going to give more money to our youth without raising taxes that give the programs that we feel that's necessary. And like, um, again, I have to go to Stephanie, they found the money to do the training in order to bring down the numbers that we're talking about. And so I think it takes an entire community to work with the school district in addition to being unapologetically involved in demanding that the system change. Otherwise, we need to um, look at the people that we are electing to those positions. I think that's another thing that we need to look at. And there's so much more I want to say, <laughs> but I'm gonna stop right there and let my colleagues speak. Fair enough, but again, appreciate, appreciate that. Cassandra, why don't, again, why don't you kind of tell us your thoughts? How do we, how do we break this cycle at our district when our district is, is broken culturally and broke financially? And I'm going to build upon what uh, Betty talked about, about collaboration and working together. Um, I look at this as a movement and, and that we're all in and we all have a role to play. Um, I know the NAACP has done some great work and even commissioning this um, report. Um, I know the Black Parallel School Board is working really hard. And, and I'm going to give credit to the school district for um, two years ago, 
bringing together an advisory group when the first report came out, which many representatives from many groups and parents were involved to really figure out how we address the, the disparities and the suspension rates and everything going on for black children, and then how we keep it accountable. So I think the movement is about all of us staying focused, and holding the district accountable, uh, being intentional about our efforts and looking for those positive outcomes because it is a system, it is institutionalized racism, it is something that has been intertwined into the really culture and, and practices of, a, of the district. Um, at the um, African American Board, I just want to give you an idea that we're still sort of, it went from task force and now we're forming a board and we had an information meeting where over 125 parents um, expressed interest and, and nearly 90 of them attended an information meeting. Those parents care not only about their children, but about the, the community and the environment. And those are the ones that we need to bring in along with all of us to say enough is enough district. But let me tell you about the district is that it's not just the district. We need to hold accountable everybody that gets paid, that has volunteered, that has some accountability for our children. And I will say that our district is in a perfect storm in that not only do we find ourselves in the midst of COVID and all of us are experiencing that one way or the other, but in addition to failing our black children, we are also in a financial crisis. We are about to be taken over by the state if we don't make some drastic changes. And so I think it's time for all of our parents and all of us to cry, yes, district, yes, school district, yes, um, Sac City Unified School District, yes, this district, yes, the teachers, the Sacramento Teachers Association, all the unions, all the volunteers, we are in crisis. And we're not only in crisis for our black children, we're in crisis fiscally. And so the passion that we have for our kids is not gonna be even addressed even a little bit if we don't really solidify the sort of foundation of our district. So as we call for action here, we can't let down on ours, but we need to know we also need to be as passionate about making sure that we're not insolvent and that our district doesn't go away. Because if we have to deal with the state, you think somebody doesn't even know our community much needs to love them. I mean, they, it's, it's gonna be a whole different ball game. So um, let's not lose sight that if we're gonna be able to continue to do what we need to be done and what we're gonna demand, we also need to be demanding, we need to figure out this fiscal thing. We need to get back to the table. We need to get those um, teachers unions and all the other unions to the table to figure out how we put the kids first. And until they put the kids first, it's gonna be hard for us to really even put a dent in what we're trying to do. Yeah, no, it's unfortunate. But yes, thank you, Cassandra. Uh, Stephanie, do you mind sharing your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I don't really have anything to say that hasn't already been said. I mean, it's clear to me that we are in crisis. Um, I think, you know, we've learned a lot through the work that we've done with the Robles School District. And while it is a much smaller school district, you know, the leadership is everything. Leadership is everything from the superintendent to the school principals to the board everybody has to be in lockstep and everybody has to agree that the the children are are i mean th these are our children our children right and so what are we prepared to do and that includes parents as well so one thing that i will say is that Ruben has, has spent considerable amount of, of time building that trust with the parents. They would follow him anywhere. And so that is key. And he's also provided them with the skills so that they understand 
what positive reinforcement means so that they know the questions to ask. And so I think that to any approach, and, and I believe this is something that we're all committed to here on this call, has to include parent engagement and really providing them with the skills and the training so that they can lift their voices and they can be outraged and they can hold all of these folks accountable. That is really, really key. And they, they have the ability, they have the agency. They just need, they need the training and they need the support and they shouldn't be expected you know, to, to do it with no compensation and no support. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, Carl, any thoughts on, again, how do we, how do we fix a, a broken and broke district? <laughs> um, go back to 2009. We've been there before. Say, everyone acts like this is a new thing. This, we've been there before. So back in 2009 and 10, when we was in a financial crisis, it was talked uh, during that period, not as long and not as deep around a state takeover, but we were in a funny, Sac City Unified School District was in a financial crisis. And not simply of its doing, but because the recession that exists. So a couple of things. One, yes, we're going to go, I think every district is going to go through some form of financial crisis. They're going to be less funding. Ours is just, uh, Sac City is deeper. The challenge is, are we willing to put at the center the question of how we provide the highest quality education for Black students? That you will not suspend, that you will educate, that that is your priority first, because they are the least of the. So if they are the least of the, and you elevate, it elevates everyone else. So you have to center first. When you begin to do your cuts, that you must say, will this do more harm than good? Because it's coming. That's number one. Number two, you, districts need to begin to think outside the box. So we worked with SACAC um, among innovative politics a number of years ago to put to get to work on a measure that the district put forward to um, uh, put an assessment, and this was only for uh, Sac City Unified School District, for assessment for after school programs and those critical programs that we need to support our students. Okay. Um, and the reason why I I felt that was important because I knew funding from the state and the feds were going to decline. And if we didn't have our own funding base that centers our kids, we will all decline together. So it was important that we identify our, in Davis, Unified School District, they, they, they self-assess themselves. And El Dorado Unified School District, they self-assess during the great, during the most difficult period of the economic crisis. We didn't do that. that um, the other thing is, and last, it speaks to what everyone has spoken about. We need all hands on deck. Everybody has to be a part of the solution. Everyone, is, is, there are people who come to us and say, you know, the Black Parallel School Board, you know, is, is engaged in education, should we have, I says, I want as many organizations engaged in education as possible. There should not be one organization. There needs to be a hundred organizations engaged in the education, uh, um, in the Sac City Unified School District, working collaboratively together, because it takes an entire community to be a learning community. But all our learning community have to have one thing that's centered. We're going to make it perfectly clear and unapologetic that we're going to be focused on anti-racism, that we're going to do what it takes to raise the quality of education for, our, for the least of these, that we will provide all resources to raise, not only to have them in the classroom, but to raise their academic performance, to provide the, the, the highest quality of pedagogy and curriculum and the rest, as well as the trauma-informed support services that they currently need. And so for a lot of our students, and particularly our students that are, um, uh, are stu uh, black students with disability, this is where we had, we had to follow a lawsuit with our district to just to let them know that 
the question around disabilities is not, just not impacting just white students. It disproportionately impacts black students and our black students with disability are disproportionately suspended, disproportionately not receiving the kind of quality education. And I, and I know, and lastly, I know there are those who would argue that we shouldn't have so many in the IEP and the 504. We wouldn't have that many in fi IEP 504 if the district provided the services for those who are moving because they're not doing well, they go into trauma, they, they act out, they, 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 they become frustrated and angry, and then they say that these, childs, these kids must have some psychological or, or behavioral problem, and therefore we must assess them. So it's, it, what happens is, is that we need to provide those kind of support and services at center, but also um, it is critically important for our um, black students with disabilities receive the kind of support um, and, 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 and recognize that they should be integrated in the classroom and not set out outside in the hallway or someplace, but become integrated part of the, of the school. So many good points in there, Carl. Thank you. Um, and again, thank you for all the advocacy that you guys have been doing at the district. Um, you know, I, I appreciate it's we've run late and I appreciate everyone's time. I want to be very respectful of that. So why don't I want to give each of our panelists, starting with Dr. Wood, a chance to just kind of weigh in with any closing kind of final thoughts they might have and particularly kind of any any calls to action. I mean, again, a lot of you have already mentioned kind of the role of parents and community leaders, but just again, any final thoughts you have for us, uh, Dr. Wood, please go first. Yeah, so first of all, I just want to Thank everybody for, for being here and being part of this. Um, you know, I, I, we've talked about like, what would it take to get us to a better point? And I wanna give you a quote that came from one of my doctoral students, uh, Sam Scales, just got his, um, his PhD. And because also, obviously what we're really talking about here is how we treat our children. And one of the things he said, I, I always repeated ever since is, it doesn't take money to treat people decently. And that's really what we're talking about. And when we're talking about the, the resource needs, we're talking about training people to treat people decently. I just want us to think about what that actually means for a moment here. The other thing that I want to say is, you know, again, all the findings in this report are, are concerning, but what always has really stood out to me is the K3 data and what we're seeing in the black box that is preschool um, scares me. Um, ultimately, what we're seeing in this district is that children are going from potty training to punishment, and that's not what we want to continue. And then the last thing I would say is um, Sacramento for me is, is a home. I, I love the community. I love the people. Um, I'm not here to, to lobby, lobby um, assaults on the district in any way. Um, what I'm really here is to be part of the solution. So I am, So if there's anything that I can do to support groups that are on the ground, Zoom makes it a lot easier to be able to be present. I am here, I want to support, I want to see the district improve. I've lived in Sacramento for over seven years. Uh, Betty and Carl and Jesse have all been very much part of my formative development. And um, in particular, uh, if it wasn't for Betty, I wouldn't have graduated from, from, uh, from Sac State. And there's a long story behind that that a few of you know. Um, and then the last thing that I'll say is, is this is that a lot of people in this Zoom environment have talked about getting back to, to normal or getting back to business as usual. I think these data show us that that cannot be an option. We have an opportunity right now to reset our system and we need to do it expeditiously. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Luke. Uh, Stephanie, closing thoughts, please. Sure. Well, first of all, it's been an honor to, to participate today. Um, thank you, Dr. Wood, for shining a light and continuing to shine a light on this issue. And, you know, I, I, I always think about uh, the words of Dr. Andre Perry, who, whose book, Know Your Price, and I see you're shaking your head, Dr. Wood. You know, he says there's nothing wrong with Black people that ending racism can't fix. And so we need to keep that at the center of these conversations when we talk about the suspension of our black children. And if we do that, then everything else should be easy. 
And so I'll just leave everybody with that. I love it. That was great. Thank you. Uh, Cassandra, your final thoughts for us this afternoon? Yes, and I think um, Carl Pinkson summarized it really well as to where we need to be going. I want to stress intentionality and collaboration. And I think if we're intentional about really the achievement and the support for African American students, we can't give up. We can't give up. We can't give in to the systems that exist. We need to keep on keeping on in this movement. Uh, secondly, we need to get engaged and be engaged. And it's the parents, it's the students that we need to really understand that they have a voice and that this is their voice uh, to really put our children first. And then I just want to comment on being resourceful because um, I agree with Dr. Wood, you don't need a lot of money to treat people right. However, you do need the, the will, you need the training, which we have been unable to get because we haven't been able to come together. And in fact, right now, I would suggest that there are resources out there that we need to tap into because of the social and racial unrest that will be able to support trying to systemically change what we know is fundamentally wrong. Um, that resourcefulness also has to translate into what we talked about, about everybody being either a part of the solution or otherwise you're part of the problem. And I can't emphasize that enough as we have really deep, as you described, uh, fiscal and financial challenges in our district. We need to come and we need to do what we need to do to make sure that all the efforts that we've done, and it's, it is a marathon, it's not a sprint, it is a movement, not a moment, and let's keep moving it forward. Thank you, Cassandra, and again, thank you for your leadership in these, on these topics. Uh, Betty, do you mind again sharing us with your final thoughts? And again, thank you so much to you and the NAACP for, for being instrumental in getting this conversation started in Sacramento. Thank you. And um, first and foremost, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Wood. And I'm going to apologize for calling you Luke. I was reminded of back in the Sac State days when you were just as passionate as a young lad when we first met. But that's another story. But I'm just so proud of you. I have to say that, um, that you brought us all together. And I think part of my takeaway from this is that we need to speak in one voice. We need to be a collaborative in one voice. We talk about being intentional and we need to be intentional in, with one voice. And to hear the work that everyone is doing is absolutely, um, is, it's awesome. But I, I want to work and I'm telling all of you now, I, I wanna work with you. There's not enough hands to do what we need to do. In addition, um, we are having um, a state convention this coming Saturday with our new president, um, Rick Callender for the NAACP. So I wanna take the information that I received today and create a statewide resolution so that all 52 branches of the NAACP can implement the recommendations that was brought forth today. But being from Sacramento, I think the, the start of being one voice and, and speaking in harmony when making a change starts right here, starts today with all of us. So I'm going to make a promise to all of you that I'm gonna personally reach out to you to see what you're doing so that the NAACP can support that. And so that you, when you walk into the room, you're walking in with NAACP, Urban League, Black Parallel School Board, United Way, all of us are walking in together. So thank you for the opportunity to making this happen, Daniel. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all. Um, and Carl, lastly, do you mind again giving us your closing thoughts? Yes, well, it's always an honor to be in the presence of these powerful people. So for me, it's like, wow. Um, um, my, I, I think much of what uh, Betty and, and others have spoke to um, uh, is, is, is is pretty much what um, I also feel. I think we have a saying in the Central Valley Movement Building, one voice, many action. 
And we all need to have one voice as to what we want to do. And I think it comes down to the total transformation of the educational system, that we need to bring the Sac City Unified School District into a 21st century multicultural education system. And part of it is, is, is that it still operates in a 19th century module or mode of education, and we need to get it into a 21st century multicultural education. And, and, and part of that is that we, um, as, as, as Betty indicated, um, we need to learn and, 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 and utilize the data and, and, and recommendation from Dr. Wood and his team um, uh, and, and, and bring that forward. But we also need to take it to uh, also to other areas as well to highlight and uplift. Now, I work in some lately up and down the Central Valley. I want to, I normally don't always say this, but Sacramento is not the worst in some cases, but uh, it is not always the best. And so, one of the things that the data uh, um, keeps, you know, uh, keeps us doing is that we always have to hold the educational system in this system, Sac City Unified School District, accountable. So a number of years ago was Sac High that had hot, when he did the two, two year Sac High and a couple of other schools that had high, high suspension, he basically gave me a direction for those schools that we are um, uh, uh, need to focus on. And then lastly, um, uh, at Black Parallel School Board, we're, we're, we're creative thinkers, but we like and we learn from everybody else. So what what's happened in Robles, we want to replicate in Sac, in Sac City. What happens in LA, we want to replicate in Sac City. What happens in Chicago, we want to replicate. It's the same in New York. And part of that is parent engagement. Part of that's the, the, you know, the program that is, uh, is, is offered. Whatever works, we need to be able to um, utilize it in, in our district and, and have it implemented in our district. And I just, I personally, I, I'm third generation Sacramento. I believe we can make this happen. We can do this. If we have the will, if we don't always have the money, but if we have the will, we can lead the way for the rest of the nation um, and, and, and most particularly for California. Well, thank you for those words, Carl, and, and thank you all. Uh, you know, I know as a as a parent of four students, you know, and uh, with a kindergartner, I'm I'm in it for the long haul, and I and I I'm ready to do something transformational. So we've got our we've got some work ahead of us in the new year. But uh, I just want to close by saying thank you to Dr. Wood and to Mohammed for for elevating these issues and for your leadership and your passion about these topics. And then thank you to to Betty, to Cassandra, to Stephanie, and to Carl uh, for a really thoughtful discussion and just your ongoing leadership in our community. So thank you all and thank you all to the audience. So many folks who joined us today who took time out of their day. Really appreciate that. Um, and again, more to come in 2021. We've got a lot of work to do for our kids. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.